willing to bring together this pilot. So we're really excited to be here today and start some of that sharing. We're really keen to share with yourselves um, and others around um, the learnings as they go and not just at the end. So please feel free to hold some questions till the end um, and hope you enjoy um, the, sh the sharing. OK, so the plan is that I'm just going to do a little bit of scene setting on where the national situation is around digital inclusion and kind of why that leads up to looking at social housing being important um, and especially a kind of regional perspective rather than just a national perspective. I might just mention some other projects that we're doing and one or two of my project colleagues are here with us on the call. Um, then I'm going to pass over to, to Bina who's going to talk about why this is important um, for Manchester and then I'll just do a brief outline of how the evaluation plan is is set up and what what we tend you know intend to do and the kind of logic to that um after which i think tanya will jump in and just talk about how doing some of the survey work that's been done was important for stockport um and stockport homes i'll then hog the limelight from that work and look at some of the the results from it and then finally i've just been recently working on data released by ofcom <clears throat> last week or this month about issues because you know cost of living and everything about affordability but also attitudes to social tariffs which are quite important to this pilot um, and important to the ISPs and so on and there might be some circles to square or you know round pegs and square holes issues there that we might want to collectively um, think about so that's the plan for the day please do put some questions in the chat and, and I'll try and make sure we get through everything so that there's a good time for discussion at the end. Right, I'm going to do the share screen thing now, which worked earlier. So all fingers crossed it works now. Um, <laughs> um, now everybody's turned into tiny little pictures on the bottom. Can someone confirm? Bina, can you see that that's working? We can see it. Right. We can see it. Good. OK. So um, a quick overview of the national picture. Um, those people who have heard me speak before uh, will know that we take things like the Ofcom data uh, each year here in Liverpool and we reprocess it and use a, some fancy statistics um, to kind of work out what kinds of levels of internet use people have in the country. And pretty consistently now for four or five years we've got the same kind of results a couple of groups that do everything online what differentiates them is one group will do things like email a politician or get involved in an online campaign type thing and one doesn't some ones that really do most things but not as much you're going to general users and that what differentiates them is some do more social media than the others and then three groups which are very limited in their use. One is predominantly young people who mostly we've got, I've written S and E down here because it's mostly social media and entertainment media that they engage with. And then some people who do very little um, and they may or may not, not do social media. So we tend to call those last five groups, that's five, six and seven um, limited users. And then obviously there's another group, which is the people who are not online at all. If you take last year's Ofcom statistics, <clears throat> we find that nationally about 8% of people are not online at all. But that they, that those limited groups add up to a further close to 30% nationally, you know, 30 something percent nationally. So the picture of people moving online and therefore they're great, they're online, is one that I've fought for a long time to say that, you know, access is just not it's just a starting point <clears throat> and we have an awful lot of people in these very limited digital use categories and therefore you know when you look at that that's multiple millions of british citizens are not really getting the full benefit of of being online and the pandemic has pushed lots of people to do things online such that the big baseline office for national statistics type measures of have you done something on the internet in the last few months means that most people say yes 
So it looks, oh, we've got 90 odd percent of people online, whereas actually the reality on the ground, as many people on the call know, is both more, more nuanced and there are a lot of people with struggling, really struggling to get reasonable internet access still. Whoops. So throwing more figures at you, if you break this down regionally, you find, you know, quite a bit of variation by region. And I think that's why regional stuff's really, really important. We're working with the Welsh Government on a project. We've worked historically with Scotland as well. They've got their own devolved interventions on this. And um, similarly, the work we're doing here with Greater Manchester and also Liverpool City region, um, because there are important variations. <clears throat> so, for example, in the northwest, you know, we're not too bad on, <clears throat> you know, non-users compared to Yorkshire or um, and other parts of the country where there are larger numbers of people who are simply not online, Yorkshire and Wales, which may be about being rural. At the same time, they have much lower levels of people who are limited users. When people get online, they do more online. <clears throat> so there are different regional challenges that's important to take into account. But compared to the South East, everybody's got m many more of those limited users than places like the southeast around london now if we kind of look at don't worry about the big statistics on the left what makes somebody a limited users well these things have been coming out year on year they're most they're unlikely to have post 18 education um, they're less likely to be confident about their literacy especially if they're young which is an interesting thing um they're more likely to have a health condition. They're more likely to be in social housing or some kind of private, non, kind of some kind of managed social housing because they're unlikely to own their own home and they're unlikely to be a private rentee. Um, they're very unlikely to be in that 35 to 45 year old range. They're much more likely to be over 45, but for those social and entertainment media users, they are young, you know, they're in the 18 to 30, 18 to 25 bracket. They're much more likely to be from a really low socioeconomic background. If you know your national readership scales at A, B, C1, C2, they're much more likely to be in D, E, and they're also very unlikely to be working. And if you compare the, the most extensive users to the most limited users, you know, the limited users are eight times less likely to have a university education. They're twice as likely to have below national average confidence in literacy. They're nearly two times as likely, less likely to be homeowners, 10 times more likely to be older, four times more likely to be poorer, one and a half, 1.3 times less likely to be working and a little bit more likely to be retired. And if we look at these things in detail, extensive users have gone to university and our limited users don't. As you can see, the literacy thing comes from those low. Level social media, social and entertainment media only um, users have the lowest um, confidence in literacy. This may be issues around first and second level language English, and I think that seems to have got worse over the last few years, that lack of confidence. So I think that needs further looking at. Um, as we said, um, poorer people who are offline or low limited users are much more likely to be in social housing, though there are low level wealthier users who tend to own their own home. So they tend to be older users in a different circumstance to others. Um, who are low users. And I think, again, that shows the importance of understanding what's going on regionally or locally in those populations. Um, as you can see, the less you do online, the more likely to, you are to be older. That's the big red bars at the bottom. Apart from those young people who have a very similar age profile to those, um, some of our other more active users but they don't do very much online, but they are younger. Um, more likely to be 
of lower economic status. Um, if we look specifically at those people are not online, things are much darker. Um, you know, they're far more likely to have no education at all than any other group. Um, they lack um, literacy confidence like that the social and entertainment media users do. Um, they're much more likely to be suffering from some long term health impact. They are older. They are predominantly 55 and above post retirement age. Um, and they are all predominantly in the lowest socioeconomic groups. So what does this mean then if that's the national picture? Now, unfortunately, the national statistics aren't fine enough to go and say something about a particular ward or a particular you know, part of a city, etc. But if you model that across Greater Manchester, it's about 40% of residents are likely to be in those lower ability, that lower engagement, non-user type categories. Then those groups of lower educational attainment be in social grades D and E, and a large proportion of them are in social housing, um, especially the poorer ones. Therefore, you know. Um, from the point of view of wanting to do some kind of digital inclusion program, targeting different groups in um, social housing is just a clear, obvious kind of policy intervention point, especially young people who may have low skills, may have come out of care, may have come out of education early, um, you know, um, not in education and training or whatever, um, or work. Um, older residents, especially those a good beyond um, um, retirement age and people with long term ill health issues. Those are all ones that really come out of this data as nationally as being key ones, ones to look at. And that is where the work in Greater Manchester has targeted and is the targets for these um, interventions that are being planned. So my plan now is to hand over to Bina and for Bina to talk about the the pilots. So have I stopped I sharing think, there? Yes, I'm just going to share mine. Um, can you all see this? Um, you, you might I just have to I can't see yeah, you, so you might. Can, yeah, perfect absolutely. okay um thanks very much Sim um for providing that overview I just wanted to give a bit of a, a sense of what does this mean for Greater Manchester and for many of you on the call um I've been working with you well we our team has been working with you all for um the past couple of years certainly across the UK and um, because we all recognize that digital exclusion is a, a global if not national challenge and we all have to play our part in trying to address this um just a little bit of context around Greater Manchester I know Sim's already touched upon some of those um stats now when we were looking at the start of the pandemic um we were seeing that you know, the pandemic really highlighted um, the divides in many different ways. Um, we saw that the government was supporting people that were medically vulnerable. But as many of you have seen, those that were digitally excluded was another layer of vulnerability that that came up and was apparent. Um, but we didn't quite know the depth of the issue. Um, we saw that across our 10 local authorities and we work in partnership with our 10 local authorities in Greater Manchester. Um, and we were being asked the same questions, you know, how can we get a better sense of our data locally? Because actually the national stats um, and the ONS data sets, stats of people that hadn't used the internet for the past three months, didn't quite um, get to what we were seeing on the ground, people that simply didn't have the ability to or the tools to, um, as well as young people in education who could continue their education. We were hearing from teachers taking papers around to children at the end of the school day because they didn't have connectivity or a device at home. Um, we were seeing that people could not access vital services very swiftly um, this became a concern for leaders across Greater Manchester. 
We know that digital exclusion is a facet of social exclusion, and we believe that digital inclusion in Greater Manchester is um, a basic human right, um, and that connectivity is a basic utility. Um, and for many of us, um, we've been firefighting. We've been trying to come up with emergency solutions to try and address what we're seeing, the emerging um, complexities of the challenge. Um, we set up a device fund at the start of the pandemic um, to support young people in schools, but we recognised um, it was just a drop in the ocean. Many of what we can do um, is just that emergency challenge, but what we had to step back and say is, actually, what do we need to do to sustain this? What does it mean to be a human in an increasingly digital world where services are staying online we know that it means access to healthcare, access to education. Um, and in Greater Manchester, we saw pre-pandemic, we had some of the highest levels of child poverty in the UK. We've got some of the highest levels of unemployment in the UK, even though we boast um, the biggest uh, digital and tech cluster outside of London, we recognise our world-class strengths, but we also recognise those gaps. And hence our commitment, which the mayor is behind, around our digital inclusion agenda. And just looking at what this means for Greater Manchester. We see this as 1.2 million residents, that's 41% of our population are digitally excluded in some way. We know that 20% of Greater Manchester residents live in social housing. So this particular pilot um, brought together that target group to look at whilst we were talking to internet service providers across the pandemic, um, collectively trying to reassess how do we support vulnerable people? How do we support people that cannot quite afford to stay online or to be connected? We all own a lever and a part of the picture and we had to rethink ways of supporting people that were sustainable. So this pilot, I just wanted to come back with um, some of the objectives. This pilot was really a way to really get to the ground, the evidence base. Um, we're working with five social housing providers that's connecting up to 5,000 residents in Greater Manchester. What does this mean for Greater Manchester? The impact of a model of best practice with internet service providers, with social housing providers, as well as local authorities could have really impact on Greater Manchester given that 20% of residents live within these housing settings. The pilot objectives are here. Um, and again, there's, we've seen the impact beyond this, but really this is about how do we get a good evidence base around people's lived experience, as well as what does it mean for people um, within who are over 75, people that are within um, who are in disabled groups and um, young people who are our three priority groups in Greater Manchester. And again, the optimum model of um, wider rollout, um, including some ideas around standardising way leaves to maximise investment and competition. This pilot is really intended to determine what a sustainable model for digital inclusion looks like for social housing providers. And I know that we're going to hear at the rest of the, um, the event today some of the depths of insights from residents themselves that we can't quite ignore. But in, in a cost of living crisis, this is an increasingly um, concerning um, challenge for us, but also talking to you all, it seems to be um, definitely on everyone's mind around how do we work better together and what do we collectively need to do in terms of understanding what role do we play to address digital exclusion. So I'll just end on this note um, and hand back to Professor Simeon Yates. Um, we certainly saw that digital exclusion was everyone's problem, but no one was quite owning it. We've seen digital exclusion pre-pandemic fall within the gaps of um, within councils of digital transformation teams um, or, or IT teams. But really, this is our part in owning um, the problem in Greater Manchester. And hopefully we can, with these shared learnings, we can help support um, others across the UK. Thanks, Mina. Okay. I'm, I'm going to reshare my slides um, one second. Um,
kind of just gently remind colleagues if you can keep your microphones off between sessions um we don't get um so a bit of bleed over from people's other bits of um life um okay um evaluation approach um so here's here's a a slide stolen from greater manchester on the kind of logic to all of this you know um as we've kind of already laid out the kind of conditions and, and the objectives of of this and the rationale for going for um a social housing led intervention i mean the goal is to work with the five isps the five social housing providers um, and five local authorities to to find a way of making something that works or trying things and seeing what the issues are with them um in each of these areas that's all now well underway with conversations and interventions and other things all sort of trundling and forwards and starting now in the five areas um of manchester of greater manchester um once we've done some baseline stuff on that which i'll come on to in a minute and the activities have taken place we will then do some kind of post um intervention assessments and see what's what's happened and see if we hit those intended outcomes that um bina laid out in the slides and i kind of measure hopefully some of the impacts of these different approaches so that's the kind of overall logic to the thing um in terms of what we're going to do um we've got um seven steps to the kind of evaluation we're doing some initial uh, both quantitative and qualitative baseline work with both uh, in the social housing areas including collecting some new data and also looking at some of those national data sets that i've already presented today and some qualitative works and focus groups with the target populations such as say older people younger people people with uh, long-term health issues in each of those areas and also we as a team at liverpool are interviewing all the people involved in this we've started now with the social housing providers we'll be moving on to talking to things like the isps etc to get their perspective on this and the process and what's working and what's not working as an actual kind of intervention process hopefully then we'll be able to get some data from and the social housing providers and the isps on uptake and engagement in different parts of their in each of these re areas and in each of these different uh, populations and then we will go back and do a kind of reverse of what we did at the start of talking to people who've been engaged with the pro program to understand what they've got out of it and then to do some more survey work around um, what benefits people have gained from engagement and then overall you know doing a kind of assessment of how these different interventions have worked as case studies um, for others to learn from and um, we've got a lot of support the isps have provided some funding which is paying for the team at liverpool at the moment to do the first parts of these parts one to three of the project and um, we've also got lots of support and huge thanks to them for that from the social housing providers in terms of survey work and engaging with communities etc um that we're, we're trying to scrape together yet more funding for the latter parts of the project um to do their final um evaluations so where are we at now um so we're in the process of getting all of this baseline data together as the projects are starting um in terms of access skills and and support etc um as we'll present in a minute, we have taken a survey already done by Stockport Homes at the, in the, uh, earlier in the year, and we've redesigned that for each of the other four areas. So they will be rolling those out in the next week or two. Um, and we're setting up the um, focus groups to be run in a week. So it's time, um, first part of December, with the social housing groups, um, try and get that on the ground community engagement though we've already done one of those in manchester with southway done some of those already in manchester with southway homes um and then as i said we're doing it kind of more formal interviews and discussions with all the parties in the program 
the moment to understand their expectations, hopes, worries, challenges as the programme starts. So that's where we are at at the moment. So um, I was going to pass over just now to, to Tanya just to talk about the programme and the value of doing the survey work for um, for Stockport. Um, and then I will jump in and, and give some some of the data. If that's OK. Yeah, that's great, Simeon. Um, I haven't got a presentation for people, so you'll just have to look at me and listen or <laughs> imagine one. So uh, I just want to cover with you some of the um, insights and some of the challenges we've had as being part of the Greater Manchester Social Housing Pilot. So in terms of how important this pilot has been to Stockport Homes, um, we're a relatively large provider. We've got 11,500 uh, properties um, and we work in some really, really deprived areas of the borough. Now, although we do have a lot of information about our customers generally, we've never really held any digital information on people. The only information we have is sort of proxy information about people's email addresses and their mobile phone numbers. So we're making assumptions from those rather than having a real understanding of where people are at, whether they're online, what devices they have, etc. So this um, opportunity has been absolutely amazing for us as a business, both in terms of having a much better understanding of what digital exclusion looks like amongst our customer base, also involving with other um, digital partners, including the internet service providers and the other social landlords, but also for us as a business, so that we've been able to use the information that we've gathered, which Simeon will go through in a minute, to actually change our approach to customer access and to how we do digital and how much of an emphasis we put on that as a method of people getting in touch with us and of us disseminating information and communication to people. I'm sure in all of your organisations, there is more of a push toward digital and improving your digital services and making sure that they're as accessible and as attractive to people as possible to enable you to be able to sort of not cut back exactly, but be able to focus on those customers who aren't able to access those services and use the extra resources to support them with face to face and phone contact. And that's certainly been true at Stockport Homes. And the information we've got from the survey has enabled us to correlate for the first time things such as um, not just overall how many people are online, but also to correlate things such as um, the household type. So whether it's a family or a single person or a person with a disability and how that links to how likely they are to be online. And even for those who are online, we've got a much better understanding that that's not a sort of binary yes or no, they're online. It's actually more complex than that. So we have people who are online, but only in a really limited way. We would never have known that had we not asked questions about the types of use they were putting into their into their digital access. So that's been absolutely invaluable. And we've also found that even though all the areas that we surveyed are stop homes properties, and we would have sort of said as a blanket that they were all deprived neighbourhoods, there's really large differences between those neighbourhoods in the levels of connectivity. So again, that's something that we would never have found out and we would have assumed that they were all pretty similar and they're not. So uh, Simon has helped us to dig down into that information and really get some really valuable stuff that we can use to tailor what we're doing to meet people's needs. In terms of how it's um, impacted on our role in supporting residents, um, we've already had for a number of years quite a few support mechanisms in place. So we use the National Data Bank, we have a device loan scheme, we have affordable refurbished computers um, and we also do free skill sessions, which I'm sure a lot of you do in your organisations as well. But it's alongside that having a really good understanding that actually the number of people who are still not online in spite of our efforts over the years is around one in four. So that's a huge proportion of our tenant base and it's higher than we would have thought it was. So even as I say, even those who are online aren't necessarily online in the way that we might understand as professionals who use the Internet constantly for work and for personal use. So we clearly need a lot more emphasis on, on the skills training and not just for those who aren't using the Internet at all. And then particularly with the cost of living challenges, that's exacerbated it further. We're doing a lot of work, as I'm sure you have, around supporting people with increasing bills and income not matching, matching expenditure. And also with some of the health and wellbeing issues that are, people are facing, particularly around mental health challenges. And that's obviously got really strong links to digital in terms of people's ability to access services and information and to be connected and not be isolated. So it's repercussions across the whole, the whole of our support base for our customers. Uh, just thinking about some of the challenges that we face from being part of the um, pilot and also from the findings. 
Um, the actual survey that we've done went really well. And part of the reason for that was that not only did we have the support of uh, the GMCA, who've been brilliant, but we've also had the support of other housing providers. We've had the support of Simeon and the um, internet service providers, but we've also involved a lot of local partners. So we have, uh, we're fortunate to work with a local social enterprise uh, called Startpoint, who deliver our skills sessions. And they have a really grassroots understanding of how to ask the right questions and the types of issues that people are facing that we would never necessarily have got the questions right if we hadn't have spoken to them. So that's been a really important learning point for us. And I think as a result of that, we came up with a survey that whilst it wasn't perfect, it has worked really well. And Simeon's obviously refined it further so that we can spread that out and use that good practice um, to, to benefit other social housing providers. Um, we have had some challenges around working with internet service providers. We're all allocated a different one. Ours has been, there's been some challenges around flexibility and the re realism around how affordable some of their social tariffs are. So there's a quite a fixed mindset around it's £15 a month for a 12 month contract and that's what you get. And we have obviously been able to get some really good quality insight to say, well, do you know what? That's not really what is suitable for our customers. Majority of them have no idea that social charities exist. Those that do know they exist, £15 is the absolute upper limit of what they feel they're able to pay. And actually, we're looking at more like sort of five to £10 being realistic. Um, and then lastly, having to commit to a 12 month contract when you're on a low or fluctuating income is really quite a big thing for people and actually doing a rolling month on month where people can cancel it or restart it as their circumstances change is a really important aspect for people and that was the most popular time scale that people would like to commit to in terms of just sort of running it month on month so again we, we wouldn't have we've known that but now we can share that with the internet service providers and hopefully the collective efforts that we've made will help to shape what they do in future and to be able to lobby for for a much more realistic um, model of delivery for social tariffs for people. And then lastly, it's emphasised that even if there is a much better infrastructure nationally around um, digital and that there's you know, massive improvements and upgrading and modernisation of digital networks, that's not enough. And actually, we need to have a really clear understanding at a local and regional level of what digital poverty looks like. We can't assume that everybody's in the same position. We can't assume that doing one thing will benefit everyone because it really won't. And even within Stockport, we've discovered these little nuances that we wouldn't have known about. So that's a really important thing that we're hoping to deliver back to sort of regional and national government around what needs to be done in future to make sure that digital inclusion work is actually impactful for the people who need it and actually leads to real change around digital poverty. That was me done. Thanks, Sim. Thank you, Tanya. So I'm probably just going to now um, show you the figures behind some of the points that, that Tanya's really helpfully made. So um, is that is that showing right now? Yay, good, yeah. okay, good. Um, one second, it's gone funny on my screen here. There we go, right. Um, so um, if we talk about the data from Stockport Homes, I mean, this was, I have to say a really solid piece of great survey work by Stockport Homes We've got close to 500 of their residents so a really good representative sample of, of their residents um, and a lot of really kind of rich um, data in it so it's been you know from an academic point of view it's been good fun to have a chance to work work through it not that necessarily the story it's telling is necessarily fun so um, I mean as with the national picture, um, the majority of people have basically said, no, I'm I'm not online, are um, older in the close to or post retirement age brackets. And again, you know, some quite large proportions of people in those age groups um, not being online full stop. Um, also, um, you know, statistically, um, there's a large proportion of people who have um, a long term health issue or a disability who are in the not online category. Um, I mean, and as we know from COVID and everything that's happened since that if you're not online, you've no longer got 100 percent access to healthcare these days. You know, I think it's an important point to, to remember now that some of the point of contact for the health service which itself is under massive pressure is digital and one of the health services responses to try and save costs is to make things digital and unfortunately it's a you know a bit of a problematic loop loop there and um, when you're talking 20 odd percent of uh, uh, people who um, you know 
don't don't go online being um having long term health issues it's a problem um as um um Tanya was pointing out it's quite it, there's a geography to this you know um there's a little map of stockport um postcodes and, and you can see from um the graph here that you know um the people um in SK7, SK6, SK4 and SK2 are more likely to be offline. That reflects the demographics in those areas, but it does point to the fact that, you know, you need to think about the different circumstances those different demographics are in and possibly even the different housing formats and and so on. In prior work we did in Sheffield over a decade ago, you know, housing format had a real impact on what types of support you can offer on the nature of the buildings that people are in and the, the social and the community spaces that that those those areas provide you know so again as, as tanya said getting insight into that look you know uh read you know not regional but you know local um um differentiations can be really really useful for thinking about interventions um you know um Smartphones and tablets are the main devices that people who are online are dependent on. You know, there is a, a notable proportion of people who are smartphone device only. Um, that's a very different digital experience than having multiple devices. And where people do have multiple devices, it tends to be a smartphone and a tablet or a smartphone and something else, include possibly a laptop. But the number of people with good, high quality, you know, digital devices or multiple digital devices in the home is actually quite low compared to the national national picture. I'll go over that in a moment. So, you know, um, over 75s are the least likely to have a smartphone. If you're under 55, they're more likely. Um, very few people in this survey have got like a stand, like a work type desktop PC. Now, lots of families don't these days. But there is a very, very few compared to the national averages have got a kind of proper desktop setup. And whenever you think about work these days and hybrid working and so on, this is an immediate disadvantage. Um, slightly older people, you know, over mid, you know, past being a young person, have got a smart TV, probably because they're more settled and et cetera. Um, the older you get, though, the less likely you are to have things like a laptop. And importantly, um, less than half of the respondents here have got a laptop. Um, though, you know, tablets are more um, common across all age groups. So it's about the type of being online that you can have, whether you've got, if you're a smartphone only and so on. What I really picked up from this data is that though a lot of people have got internet access, there is still quite a large proportion of this population where their access to the internet is through data and not through a broadband connection. Now that relates also to age and various other things, but there are quite a lot of households that are dependent solely on mobile data, and I'll come on to why that's important in all sorts of ways in a minute, than um, others who have got access via Wi-Fi at home because of um, having broadband. So, um, 70% of the people are smartphone only. The UK average, looking at the last bits of Ofcom data on technology ownership, is less than 10%. So, you know, already we've got almost twice as many people in this population are smartphone only than the national average. Not, um, most have one other device. The most common sync device is a tablet or a laptop. You know, um, Like I said, um, only 53% have got a laptop or a PC. The national average for that in the UK is 74%. 74% of UK households on average have a laptop or a PC. And notably in this data set, as Tanya was saying, thinking about different types of households, 17% of the households in this survey that had children were smartphone only. So that, you know, is very, you know, those who are online and have got reasonable access, what do they mainly do? It's predominantly social. 
you know it's predominantly communicating with friends social media watching telly etc and so on why is this important i think this is really important because so many interventions focus on we will give you digital access for health or we will give you digital access for education or we will give you digital access for this good thing whereas most people's use of the internet is broad and what's really important to them is connectivity connectivity with community and friends and family um you know there's that's got to be part of people's thinking when they're doing an intervention is you're not just supporting people to get a job or to get access to health service so that's really really important you're keeping their social connections alive um i haven't put it in these slides but maybe we should share it afterwards um one of the good things foundations um data poverty lab people kat dixon done this wonderful graphic that she's called like you know digital inclusion table of elements where it shows all these different aspects of social or you know work um public health you know activities life that we do and all the different types of activities we do under them and which of them have now become at least partly or wholly digitally done and it's a big table right but a core part of that is being being in the world being sociable and i think we need to remember that and then when we do look at access to things like health or local stuff, a lot of those, not a lot, but a notable proportion, close to 20% of the older adults are not using digital, if they've got digital, to get bits of information about health, local community or other activities. So again, um, even though they might be online, they're not necessarily using it for some of the things that might be beneficial to them. So that was my quick overview of some of the data from um, from the, the survey. There's loads more in there. There is, as, as Tanya said, a bit of a breakdown by household types and with children and not children, etc. There's also some data which I'll come on to a bit later on about um, attitudes to social tariff and, and affordability. Um, but those are the kind of some of the insights we're hoping to get from running the same survey or something very similar survey in the other four social housing areas. So unless anybody wants to do it, I'm going to run on to um, the stuff from the focus groups and then on to the affordability stuff. So we've run some focus groups already in the south of Manchester. Um, one with younger people and one with older adults including you know we tried to get sort of 75 plus so not just recently retired but kind of much older adults um um so what did we find talking to the young people well first off they were focused on their smartphones um you know um laptops and pcs if they've got access to them for college work or school work um maybe gaming if they'd got a console or whatever. Um, some of them were using things like consoles to access the internet because they only had a console and a, and a smartphone. Um, but what was really, really clear from talking to them that data was everything, you know, because they're consistently on the move. They're not sat at home or sat in work. Um, they would be very they could I mean this really struck me is how organized they were about turning their data on and off to save it over the month you know so um if you're somewhere if you're not going to be doing you know you're doing something where you won't be able to use your phone you turn the data off to make sure that you don't waste it on things on background apps or whatever um quite a lot of them were dependent on relatives for bits of top-ups of data and so on they talked about brothers and parents providing top-ups of data just to get them through the month etc and um, some of the social housing um staff talked about the fact that some of the their clients would kind of go offline for the end of the month because the data had run out and then they get a flurry of activity when they they, they got their allowance back in the next month um what having wi-fi at home was how you kept your data package alive um they knew lots of places for free wi-fi locations whether they be shops cafes whatever they had a really big rant about the fact there's no wi-fi on the buses in manchester anymore 
because that's dead time if you're sat on the bus for an hour going into town or going to college or or school or whatever or going to 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 something um it was a great time to do all your messaging with your friends and so on because you've got free wi-fi on the bus now that's gone that was that really had an impact on them they were not particularly interested in fixed broadband you know um unless it came with the accommodation because they were on the move and they needed to pay for their data um, and like i said they keep experiencing lots of moments of disconnection when data ran out or wi-fi hotspots were not available but for them the idea of a data package solution to digital inclusion you know getting things like the data bank getting a very low rate or low cost or even free chunk of data on a regular basis was really was what would be really attractive to them as a social tariff stroke support intervention the older adults it was the completely opposite story um some of them in the group there's a small number who just said i don't have the internet and i don't want it which many of us who've worked with older adults on digital inclusion have heard for multiple decades um quite a lot of them though did have broadband they had broadband as part of some phone stroke tv deal yeah so we did pick up some a number of stories about effectively mis-selling of really substantive packages you know 70 80 pound 90 pound packages that involved every tv channel um and then relatives stepping in afterwards and having to unpick that or the moment that year-long contract was came to an end of getting their relatives on something much more reasonable um huge amounts of reliance on relatives to maintain the technology for them to keep the connection running and so on and a lot of them did have smartphones um but they did a limited range of things on those um you know calls games checking the news and so on their really big issue around digital inclusion was skills and confidence it was less about you know getting um online for the majority of this group um it was about skills and confidence that said you know they all complained extensively about the extent to which services have gone digital by default and in one person spoke very strongly about the fact that they had given up on their gp because the only way to get to the gp was an online booking and it didn't work very well on her phone and she didn't like it and she wanted to talk to someone so she'd given up bothering which is kind of like the opposite of what we want if we're providing you know the possibility of booking uh, an appointment whenever you like it could be 10 o'clock at night etc if that actually is becoming a barrier then it's not so they talked about resisting being forced online and and going to offices or using the phone because they don't want to be forced online lastly not interested in a data package type social tariff intervention of no real value to them what they would like was their broadband costs being reduced because they were looking at the time we did the focus groups this kind of upcoming cost of living crisis and one of the things that they would have to think about was how they maintained access to a phone um, and be available to their relatives um, at a cost effective manner in which case um, they might want to look at reducing their very substantially their broadband and costs but they all did like having other services like tv through it and so on um, and quite a lot of them also was reliant on telephone support services like you know emergency fall buttons and so on so they were all very aware that this is a very complex situation for them because they're sedentary unlike the young people who are mobile they've got needs like they want the television they want other services they want a, a reliable phone connection um, but the cost of all of that could become as a package could become prohibited but very clear that mobile data was not necessarily going to improve their situation nor was it likely to get their friends who were offline online um, unless it came with like a really good tablet and lots of support and lots of training and so on so they were 
it was a much more complicated story from the older adults. So the plan is to run more of these types of focus groups in each of the other social housing areas and see if we start to get similar or different stories from the different groups, you know, from young people in other areas or older people in other areas, people with long term health issues in each of the other areas. So lastly, on to social tariffs. So. Um, Ofcom has done two surveys this summer, one on cost of you know, affordability of technology and the other one on attitudes to social tariffs. Um, if we look at some of the social tariff survey data, surprisingly, a large proportion, you know, two thirds of the people they surveyed were not aware that social tariffs were available. And we know that nationally they've been taken up re at a very low level, much, you know, compared to what they could be and the number of people who are eligible. So clearly one of the challenges is getting the message out there that these are available uh, and so on. That said, um, even though if you look at the set, that set of the population and those who who because they receive benefits or you know are in a certain categories could get a social tariff, 39% of them don't think it's aimed at them. You know, so 39% of the people who could take a social tariff in this 1000 odd person survey um, didn't think social tariff was directed at them and their type of family, which again is a perception thing. So there's an issue here about getting over the perception of a social tariff being appropriate to those who could take it. Um, yet of those people, who could get a social tariff, 20% um, of them have had challenges paying for digital in the last uh, three months. So even though the majority of them don't know it's available and a lot of them are not interested in taking it up, they are still struggling or a proportion of them are still struggling to pay um, for um, their digital services, whether that's broadband, phone, whatever. And strangely enough, there's no statistical relationship between um, having challenges, yeah, and attitude to social tariffs. So it's not like the people who are struggling have got a more positive attitude or a more negative attitude to social tariffs, though there is a little bit of variation in this graph here. Statistically, there's there's no difference. So the people who are struggling and the people not struggling have got the same kind of attitudes towards social tariffs. And that's interesting because actually it's not just the poorest people who have been struggling with um, affordability of their digital access, though obviously wealthier groups you know, the social classes A, groups A and B are slight, have had slightly less challenge. All socioeconomic grades have had some affordability issue around their digital phone, mobile access in the last three months. And this was a survey uh, early summer. So that says to me that, you know, um, digital potential digital disconnection is something that's affecting everybody because it's in with a basket of other goods that they've got to pay for. You know, so all socioeconomic groups are looking to 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 manage that and reduce that. Um, importantly, of course, there may be less people in social grade DE saying they've got an affordability issue because they don't have it full stop or they've only got a very limited service. So that needs a little bit more work. But when you, you look at confidence, in being able to cover your um, digital access communications costs in the next three months. 20, and this was again summer before some of all of the cost of living has hit. 20% of poorer households were not confident they could cover their broadband or whatever costs in the next three months. So these are people who are online and currently have access. I know 
20% of that group are worried about not being able to pay for it. So when we looked at the Stockport data, you know, we found some interesting similar things. Um, 51% of those who could have had a social tariff were not interested. Yeah, 80% of those who are currently offline and could take a social tariff were not interested. Those people who were interested um, with a social tariff were younger and more likely to have children. There was no difference between how people were currently paying for their broadband, whether that was um, a, you know, a long term contract or they're on a pay as you go type arrangement or whatever, between how they're currently paying for it and interest in a social tariff. And there's no difference between whether they're smartphone only and the rest in terms of interest in a social tariff. So there is something in all of this about the messaging and the value of a social tariff not getting through in some manner or another. But also, I do think going back to Tanya's point, these have been set up as social tariffs, but when you ask people, what would you prepare to pay for this basic package, this basic type of social tariff package, they don't want to pay more than 15 pounds you know, somewhere between six and 15, 10 pounds might be a sweet spot. But an awful lot of people were not seeing a huge value in paying out for what is being offered as a social tariff at the costs currently being offered. So maybe one of the, the issues is that people see it, but they don't see it as a as enough of a benefit to want to change. And some of the reasons for not wanting to change, therefore, are they're happy with what they've got. They're in control of maybe, a, a, as Tanya said, a monthly contract with a fixed amount. They feel in control of all of that. Um, some of the older people just don't want it, so I don't want it. Um, but others are basically saying, well, if I'm paying out £15 in terms of value to me, I want more than just a 10 megabit or a 20 megabit service with nothing else, no telly, no something else with it. I'd rather stick with my smartphone only, um, you know, because I'm controlling those those costs. It's additional cost. So I actually think there is still a lot of work to be done in understanding how a, a social tariff will really work for different communities in different in different circumstances. And that is that and I hope I've left a good 20 minutes half an hour for some questions and I saw loads of questions in the the chat but I wasn't keeping track so I wonder if um anyone who wanted to ask a question could just put their hand up or if you've asked the question um on the chat Via, I wondered if you wanted to come in. I've got a hand. Sorry, Abdul. Abdul, you've got your hand up. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Abdul Kadir, and I work for the South Yorkshire Mail Combined Authority. My question is slightly more general, to be honest, and and it's just a kick off, uh, hopefully, for the rest of the uh, colleagues on the call. And I want to know, in terms of the uh, combined authorities work with the other local authorities and the partners. How did that go about and um, how did you manage sort of a really collaborative um, project in that respect? Because it's potentially something that we may be looking at here as well and the challenges that you face around that as well. Thank you. So I could probably answer that. Um, so as a combined authority work in in order to achieve um, any kind of ambition around our region, we have to work um, with our 10 local authorities in partnership with them. We also recognise, we mentioned the um, spatial inequalities as well um, earlier. We recognise that each borough has got niche challenges. So their ability to participate and be on part of this journey is different, but we're all trying to deal with similar barriers um, so really, this is about how do we come together to share resource, share learning in order to um, be part of that journey and also um, 
the local authorities better know their residents than we do. So we actually um, developed a digital exclusion risk index tool for England, Scotland and Wales because everyone was facing the same challenges. Um, it wasn't easy um, at the start of the pandemic. Everyone was in um, a kind of emergency mode. We had, um, for example, Manchester thinking about what Manchester needed, Bury thinking about what Bury needed, understandably. But what we recognised was we don't have all the answers and nobody really has all the answers. But by coming together, we could share some of what we were seeing, um, use each other as a sounding board, because we were still yet to make a case around and, and understand better kind of what was happening on the ground with the emerging challenges um, and how we could therefore respond to it. So the way that we work as a combined authority, the model that we work with is we've, um, we have to work in partnership with our 10 local authorities. Um, it's the only way that we can really um, make sure that the benefits are seen across the region and not just in particular places. Emma, did you want to come in next? Yeah, honestly, thank you so much um, for uh, this session. There is so much that is coming out of this, which uh, totally resonates, but you brought it together so powerfully and it and this just really um, needs to get out there and to, and to be shared uh, with other housing associations, with policymakers, etc. Um, I thought it was, there was a, I, I, there's so much that I want to dig into, but one of the things that I don't think was mentioned in the feedback that did come up through the chat, I don't know if the person who asked it is still around, was about the credit checks and the extent to which that has come up as another barrier. But what I also really generally agree with is that thing about there's a massive issue about promotion and awareness, but there's also this question about actually how far are social tariffs really meeting what people want and what people need such that it is it is basically worth the hassle and the stress that chain that is required to change when a lot of households are experiencing so much stress so there is just a like the bandwidth to go through a change even if it is something you want but I think this is really important in terms of how can the products themselves be improved as well as the awareness raised but thank you so much. Can I just jump in I think John I don't know whether either of the Johns is on the call today John Stewart John, John, I think they said that after Christmas all of the ISPs have got access to whatever the government API is or whatever that allows them to check whether people are eligible rather than having to go through some additional cumbersome of their own paperwork process. Yeah. And so that the, might get easier. Yeah, the DWP API, yeah. I mean, I saw a question here um, about um, um, it's gone. Where? Da, 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 da. Um, thank you for everybody who put cats um, periodic table in the chat. That was really, really helpful. Um, so there was a question here about. Um, I'm scrolling down about family data sharing. I mean, that's not come up so far, but I would be surprised if it doesn't, because of course that's another way of collectively managing it, isn't it? Is having kind of just one bill for, for everyone in the family for their data, for their for their phones and, and collectively managing that kind of thing. And um, there was also a question in there about how do we measure digital exclusion? Well, I won't, I'm not going to give the secrets away, but after Christmas, watch this space because Emma and I and others are working on a, a project where we're developing a minimum digital living standard for families. We've now finished the field work and after Christmas we'll be be launching that. It's not like a single figure, but rather it's a set of skills, facilities, kit, um, broadband levels, etc. that families themselves has defined as being the minimum you need to operate what you know reasonably, you know, in the same way with the minimum income or a kind of living wage is one that allows you to live and be, not just survive. And we'll be we'll be launching that just after Christmas. So watch this space. I can see some more hands, but I'm not sure who it is on my screen. It's um Charlotte. Charlotte, do you want to go next? 
Uh, hello. Um, I was just thinking. Um, I was speaking to some um, uh, a member from the local authority, um, one of our local locality leads, at an event recently. We were talking about promoting social tariffs, and she was out in the streets trying to promote some of the social tariffs to people in her area. And something that made, was quite interesting is a lot of the feedback that was given from people is that they, they weren't interested in the social tariff because it didn't include anything to do with streaming. And a lot of people now want to do the Netflix, and 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 that's why, and all these sort of things. And that was a really big thing to do with why people necessarily weren't engaged in the social tariffs. So I suppose I was interested um, to, to, to understand, did you get any other feedback as well? Did anybody else mention from any of the age groups or the panels anything to do with, with that in the in the research? I mean, to do with the, the social tariffs not always including everything that they needed to, to access online or, yeah. Um, no, there were a few in, in the kind of text box responses in some of the Stockport survey, there was the odd little phrase that said, I'll pay 15 quid if it includes telly, you know, um, but I think it goes back to the point I was trying to make and thank you everybody who shared Kat Dixon's report and thing is that not having that or having a deal such that like the amount of data you've got gets wiped out by two sessions of watching Netflix, you know, or in another project we're doing by one session with your counsellor because you know, you, you're a, a victim of trafficking or whatever, wipes out your data, then, you know, a social tariff that's just essentially keeping you basically connected doesn't seem to have a great deal of value because, you know, you want your kids to be able to watch some kids telly so they can talk to the kids at school about what they've seen on telly last night. And if what you're basically getting is something that allows you to pay your bills, Go do your job searches, book the GP, um, and not much else. Then why are you going to give your own money for it? I mean, I'm really reminded of a conversation we had with social housing tenant representatives back in 2010, 12, whatever, where they said, if you want us to do all of those practical things online, give us the internet for four pounds a week extra on our um, um costs of living in the social housing and our rent and and we'll do that um etc um, and if we want more then maybe we might pay a bit more but we're not going to pay an awful lot just essentially make your lives easier and i do think we need to think about if we're getting people digitally included we're including them we're not just giving them a, a little bit of a level so i do think there is a lot there is a very understandable logic in there of do I want to commit to a 12 month contract where I'm going to be dishing out 15 pounds a month when I'm struggling to pay the bills as it is whatever the benefits might be and if I'm not even getting any of the pleasurable benefits you know why bother you know if I want to watch some Netflix I'll buy some data for a month sign up for free Netflix for a month watch a few things and then turn it all off again if you're smart yeah. Just on that, just on that note, Sim. Um, so we recently had um, the results of our disabled persons um, survey. Um, I think it was over two thousand um, disabled people across Greater Manchester had filled in um, the survey and responded. Um, it was the biggest uh, one yet. Um, and what does it mean for different people? So for disabled people. Um, we're seeing with the cost of living crisis that people are making choices between food between fuel and also now their internet connectivity. For disabled people, the response was that was their only way of keeping connected. So actually the impacts of which people are um, skipping meals, they're rationing food, they'd rather put on blankets than switch off the internet connection because that is um, how they are able to make their means last and for people on low incomes there's no other way of getting more income so they have to make do with what they've got um we've also had the bread and butter thing which is a a, a food um uh, organization and they provide afford affordable food packages across greater manchester and they've been surveying the people that attend and they now have regular people that attend not people that go to food banks it's probably um it's a, a step up from from that so it's families um people that want to um 
get nutritious food close to them and it's accessible um and and that's exactly what they were saying that um when they were talking to people they were saying oh we're fine we're fine but actually when you dig deep into people's lives they were not washing their clothes as regularly they were um skipping meals they were rationing their bus fares they were not um, taking their children out to activities. So in short, and this is a statement that always stuck with me, people are taking the colour out of their lives. So that is the thing. It means different things to different people. So now our understanding of what are the basic minimum standards that people need, whether that's the ability to go on Netflix, um, you know, as part of that basic package. That's something that we're also learning from people themselves. Um, I'll come to Vicky next because you've patiently had your, your hand up and then Tanya. Hi. Um, yeah, I just want to tell you, and a lot of people on this call, I'm sure, will be aware of something that we've done in Rochdale. And that's to um, provide, um, in conjunction with a housing, a social housing uh, conglomerate is to provide some um, internet access to um, some areas in Rochdale of high poverty um, and I hate to use those words but they are areas of deprivation in Rochdale and we made a really conscious decision when we decided that we were going to install this and, and, and provide people with broadband that there would not be limitations on it that it would be exactly that if we were going to give it it needed to be as good or better than what they could buy commercial, commercially because why would you not um, and the only restriction that we've put on that is um, adult content and that's because we're a local authority and we felt it was important to protect young people and vulnerable adults um, from that and and in fairness that has been criticized and we've been criticized for taking away people's human rights but what I would my answer to that is we're not taking anybody's human rights away if they choose to watch adult content that is their choice but we will not pay for that um, they can they can continue, they can go and get their own contract, they can use their mobile data or whatever, but we will not pay for that in the package that we offer to residents. And, and as well as offering this service, as well as installing the broadband for people to access, we also ensured that we had a backup, that we would have um, devices to loan, and that we would have feet on the ground that would show people how to use the devices they already had or devices that they could loan because it was really important that we didn't just say well there you go we provided you with the internet off you go it was really important that we we gave them the tools that they needed to benefit from that um and people talk about um it being really complicated and and you can see that there are lots of nuances and lots of variations of what people's needs are but actually, good quality civic Wi-Fi would hit so many of those. I don't, I don't understand why we have to keep saying how complicated it is. It doesn't need to be. My guess is that there's a lot of money to be made from not offering that, but that would be the cynic in me, wouldn't it? Um, but there are, you know, um, we've got a long way to go and there's lots of things that we've got to do and we're learning from it, but we are rolling it out in other regions across Rochdale um, and it's been really warmly received. So whilst we might have come under fire from um, people in um, high ranking positions, we actually haven't come under fire from residents and that's who we're doing it for. Thanks, Vicky. Tanya, did you want to come in? Yeah, thanks, Bina. There's two points, really. One linked to what Bina was saying about links to the cost of living. And just to endorse what she was saying, that when we, we have a monthly internal meeting with colleagues who are working on the front line where we look at changing patterns of demand around cost of living. Um, and one of the key things that was mentioned by um, several different frontline teams was that a lot of people don't recognise that they're struggling. They think other people are struggling and it's not them and they don't want to make a fuss because there's someone worse off than them. And so we've been really careful about the language we've used when we're sort of um, offering support and initiatives to people to not use that phrase to 
make sure that people can recognise that there might be something that they can access that isn't for people who are struggling. It's just for people that cost of living has proven a challenge or some other wording that we've used. That was a really strong theme that came across. Um, the other thing was in relation to what Abdul said earlier about um, how we've managed to make it a success with the sort of partnership between the local authorities, the housing providers, the GMCA and the ISPs. And I'd say one of the key things for me, um, I'm someone who I absolutely hate going to meetings that are pointless, where there's lots and lots of chatting and nothing ever happens. And I'd say that the project has been the absolute opposite of that. There's been really clear communication. We've always felt that there's lots happening and it happens quickly and you know what's going on. And they've really listened to what the housing providers have got to say, because we obviously are on the ground in a way that GMCA and the the local authority often aren't because we're dealing with people in you know difficult situations on a daily basis so that's been a really really positive experience for us and I'd say that the model that's been used has worked really well and the reason we've managed to get so much out of it and that people are still engaged with it nearly a year down the line is because it's actually achieving things people can see the outcomes and they want to be part of it because everyone's passionate about it and they can see what we're going to get from it. Thanks, Tanya. Are there any other questions? I've seen one in the chat from, Kat is it Katayoun? Apologies if I'm um, mispronouncing your name. I wondered if you wanted to come in. Hi, sorry. Um, yes, Katayoun, very well uh, pronounced. Uh, yes, I was wondering if um, there are relationships from the other side, if you think about if people not having access to internet connection might also be worse off in terms of cost of living because uh, online you can find cheaper options or uh, with direct debit you can pay less sometimes so it's a uh, like a two um two way road in a way have you noticed any yes thank you when i i jump in um i actually think yes it's probably very likely um, a lot of people who are offline are suffering multiple forms of poverty premium because they're also, you know, um, we look at the demographics of the people who are not online, they're not partic necessarily particularly mobile, they may be stuck in, um, you know, etc. They don't have access to cheaper shops and so on, etc. Um, I do think that there are huge benefits of being online and some of them, especially if you're active online, are about making lots of savings. But I also think you need to start when when people are getting lower, lower incomes, you have to start seeing what savings will they make. So if you can save a load on your car insurance, that's great if you've got a car. When you save a load on your holiday, that's great if you go on holiday. Right. And um, if you can save a load on your food shopping, that that's great. But if, for instance, you've got debts and banking issues or what other or you've not got good banking, that's when all of that starts to really, really kick in and does that non-virtuous circle that you're you're talking about but i do think if we're going to talk to people who are struggling with a cost of living crisis that we do take account of what circumstances they really are in saying to them you could save x amount of money could be disingenuous if the, the things they could save on are things they're not doing because they're on really low incomes that said you know access to job opportunities access to educational opportunities access to support for their children etc which are all thing you know and other things like that which are all things that may or may not have an immediate financial benefit and are actually probably the things that get you out of those financial hard circumstances because you get a better job or you know you can organize your day better and you know etc work longer hours or something that helps you i'm not saying you know they should, that's the answer to all of these issues but i'm saying that it it's a nuanced thing um, and the savings and all the benefits that are on different time scales and stuff. So I think you have to have an honest conversation with people who are in a really difficult circumstance about how they can maximise the benefits if you've got them online, rather than just assuming that X amount of financial or other benefit flows. You know, because that's about having the skills and the knowledge and understanding of how to make it work for you. That was a bit if I could just add to that, I think the um, social and health benefits are really important as well in terms of hooks for people to get online. Because as you said, for some people, the financial benefits might either be quite intangible or they're a long way away from them. So I think in terms of 
the idea of particularly for older people that they can connect potentially free of charge to members of their family and friends and local community using Skype or whatever method they want to use, I think is a really important aspect. And that obviously links around health and mental health and social inclusion. So for us, I know that the work we do in our communities, that is probably the number one reason that people come to the sessions is not really around digital. And the reason they keep coming is not around digital. It's the social side of it. And that obviously has massive impact on their life. And it may incidentally end up with them saving some money on something. But having that human contact and knowing that they can be part of their community community and know what's going on and they can contact their daughter in Australia whatever it might be that's actually way more important to them than the financial side of it thanks Tanya um Kira I wondered if you wanted to come in I've noticed you've dropped something in the chat Oh yeah, no worries. Um, also, huge thanks from me as well. Really great presentation and a very, very exciting project that I think we're all just very much looking forward to following as it develops. Um, yeah, the comment I just added in the chat was following on from um, Simeon's point a moment ago about um, kind of the the challenges about making assumptions about people's cost savings that that might come from inclusion and internet use and just kind of two additional points are around the fact that often saving money through internet use actually requires a lot of time in order to kind of search for different options and pretty high levels of digital literacy to know that you're actually looking at um, the correct kind of information and that you're not maybe even uh, on a scam site and going to wind up in a worse position. Um, and then on top of that, because we know there's widespread use of algorithmic processing of people's digital footprints, their data trails online, quite often you can be looking for better prices and then be deemed kind of too risky by an algorithmic or automated process behind the scenes and wind up actually paying more um, because you're leaving kind of a data trail that indicates what kind of a buyer of a service like insurance you might be. Um, and that happens in many cases behind the scenes. People, people don't see that and aren't aware of the impact. So for these reasons, I kind of just wanted to emphasize uh, the point that's sort of already been made already. Um, around how sort of the argument for cost savings, although it it seems to resonate quite well in some policy circles, I think is one of the weakest yeah. arguments for digital inclusion because it's just so hard to guarantee that being online is going to result in meaningful cost savings and other aspects of everyday life. So just throwing that into the conversation as well. But also, I mean, under the current cost of living crisis, um, if your gas is unaffordable, I doubt you're going to find a tariff that is affordable. You know, um, if if you're at the point where food is not affordable, um, I doubt there are that many deals online that are going to make food affordable. And that's where, you know, the food bank or the warm bank suddenly comes to play. And don't get me started on that we've got to that point. But yes, I, I think in I, th I think the point and, and Bean, Bean and I were talking about this the other day that I think we really want to stress and I know Tanya stressed this as well before and I know colleagues like Emma and Kira have stressed, stressed this before is not taking digital inclusion as though it's just one thing whether it's oh get the wires in the ground and connect people or just give them these skills it's about understanding what's lo happening regionally and that's not just who's offline who's online but what you know Manchester's got different. We've just had this conversation with the Welsh Government. Manchester's got different policy levers it can pull because of the levels of devolution compared to, you know, South Yorkshire was, was speaking there a moment ago, or Liverpool, or the Welsh Government, or the Scottish Government. So the policy context is different. You know, the organisations you've got on the, the ground, you know, we were just talking about some of the organisation Tanya works with that deliver on the ground or Good Things Network people. There's different balances of those in different places. If you don't take that into account, then you just do a hand out the Chromebooks kind of solution. Um, and that doesn't address the point that's probably not been articulated fully, but kept coming out in what we saw it, have seen so far. And I know others have talked about is we don't want cliff edges. We don't want to include people and then say oh, six months oh, you're off now because the program's finished, you know. Um, so all of that is really about why this kind of targeted interventions is really important and why regions have to feed back to government that, you know, this is what you need to be listening to, you know, nationally. Um, these are things that we don't have a lever for, 
locally, but you do. But we, we know about this because we've seen it locally, not it appearing in some big ONS national survey or whatever. That was also a bit of a ramble. Thanks, Tim. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, um, and I know it's been um, hinted, well, it's been spoken about in the chat, but I just want to tell you maybe um, a quick minute or two, just if you could talk about, you know, this has been going for a while. The reason why we have gone to social housing providers is that ecosystem of support that you already provide um, your residents. And I think there's something around the power of ecosystems. We have learned that um, approaches, initiatives have to be locally embedded community in the within the community. Um, and I just wondered if we could, you can probably give a, a couple of minutes to talk about what, what does good look like? What have you found works really well? So, Billy, do you directing that at me? Thanks. Yes, sorry. <laughs> right. Cost of living, are you sort of stuffy saying? Sorry, I missed the first bit of what you said. Uh, so, what does good look like in terms of community embedded initiatives? And are you, I know you mentioned Start Point right. earlier. Yeah. And um, that's fine. There were things in the chat around kind of healthcare, and we know with Start Point, they are yeah. their partnerships with their local um, GP surgeries is the reason why one of the the benefits of having that locally embedded um yeah well, that's fine sorry i just missed the first bit what you said yeah um so just yeah just to sort of go into a bit more detail about the stuff we do with start point so um as part of this initiative we were offered some volunteering from the isp that we're working with but the problem with that is that it was short term as been has just alluded to and it was volunteers who don't know the area so what we found i'm sure a lot of you the same we found that actually the best people to deliver stuff are people who understand those communities they're groups where you've actually got volunteers who live there who understand what it's like day to day and actually have some credibility and some trust with local people so our model that we've been using for a while now is around although start point they are a grassroots organization and they do deliver the sort of the um sessions whether it's the sort of um lesson based session or a drop in for people who've got a particular issue the key thing that they always do is that they have a um a group of digital champions and they are drawn from local people and they skill them up which obviously in itself is a really positive thing around increasing people's self-confidence and their you know their ability to go into employment etc but it also as i say means that they're a lot more credible in terms of the local area and it's endorsed really by the presentation that Sim gave earlier around the massive differences in different neighbourhoods. We can't assume that we can deliver a skill session in the same format in every neighbourhood and it will be as successful as it is everywhere. Because, I mean, we've stopped some of our sessions because nobody came. And yet the same sessions in the neighbourhood next door, we've got 40, 50 people coming every week. So clearly there are really different needs and we recognise that. And it's only through using the skills and knowledge of the local people that we've been able to deliver. Um, we've also um, benefited from working with the local authority who recognise the good work that's being done generally. And we've got like a digital alliance in Stockport. And so we've been able to benefit from some funding. And so have start points have been able to embed that over the long term, because, as we've said, doing it in the short term where you've got a six months funding for digital skills and then it ends. You might as well not have bothered because people need far longer than that. A lot of the people who come to our sessions have been coming for years. And as I say, they keep coming for the social side as well as the digital skills. But then they tell other people locally what's available and then they come along and they'll obviously skill up people in their family and in their neighbourhood and that's so important and you can't get that by sort of parachuting in an external body to deliver stuff on your behalf it has to be rooted in that community to actually be to be effective in terms of the healthcare side just very briefly that's probably something that um start point have done more than us but they work really closely with um some of the local gp surgeries around um the um social prescribing so a lot of the stuff that they do in the sessions is around sort of the social prescribing agenda so they've worked really closely they're very fortunate they've got a gp surgery a health center who are really sort of forward looking and they want to work with them so i can't give you masses of detail on that but um if that was something that people were interested in they've got a really good model in place and i'm sure if you got in touch with me i can put you in touch with start point who can let you know how that works but it's certainly something that's worked really well for them for local people who want to access all kinds of services initially digital but then moving on to knowing what's on in the local area local groups communicating with other local people so that's been really positive was that okay Bini? do you want me to cover anything else no that's fantastic thanks tanya um sim it's up to you to to close well, well, well look th thanks everybody for being here just to let you know what our next steps are as I indicated earlier in the presentation, we've got surveys going out. We'll be doing some more um, focus groups. Um, while while we've been on this call, my colleague um, here has um, 
um, clearly been, uh, Belinda has clearly been adding some more of those to my diary because they popped up as I was um, as I was speaking. Um, so we're planning to run uh, another session like this um, in December, where hopefully we can feed back what we've learned from talking to all the different areas, talk to people like Tanya and, and others um, about what's going on and how they they perceive the program and the problem and the challenges and how things are developing. So we get some feedback from each of the, the regions and we'll have also done some more of the, the focus groups, if not all of them by then, so we can feed some of that local regional knowledge back. And then after Christmas, we'll be running some further ones to feedback on other aspects of the findings and um, survey work. And obviously when the things finished, the kind of final overall evaluation. So hopefully there'll be some points over the, you know, under a sort of semi monthly time period going into next year. Um, and I'm sure colleagues, um, Bina and Raheem and colleagues at um, Creative Manchester will let you all know when those are and, and so on. And there's been a lot of questions in the chat about can we have the slides? Of course you can. Um, Raheem, you've already got them. If you can just distribute them to people on the list, that'd be fantastic. We'll send it round. Thanks everyone for attending. I really appreciate your um, engagement and staying till the end. I know we've run slightly um, over, but we'll get the next dates for the next sessions over to you in the next couple of weeks. If you do want to connect around Greater Manchester's approach, I've put my email in the chat. Um, but again, thanks, thanks today. Um, and thanks Tim for, for hosting this. Take care now. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.